But there is a lot of anger right now, and you, you wrote about the political environment in your annual yep. letter to shareholders, and, and you pointed to what you call a breeding of mistrust and misunderstanding. What's yeah. your assessment of this election and the political environment right now? It's, ter it's terrible, but it is what it is. I mean, I, I can't change. I'm just one citizen. Does and, it stun uh, but, but what I don't like about the breed of mistrust, what I've said, is that denigrating classes of people, scapegoating, finger pointing, every time someone says something, you say, oh, they're complaining, all those things are actually just trying to diminish the other person. None of them are saying, are they right or are they wrong, and what should we do about it? Abraham Lincoln, never denigrated, never scapegoated, never finger pointed. So when you look at America, you know, one thing is to be yelling at each other, another thing is to be killing each other. You said, all of us should listen to great thinkers who have an alternative point of view. Yeah. So who do you listen to that's a great thinker that has an alternative point of view? We're, we're, we're just very smart how they analyze issues. Uh, Arthur Brooks, uh, uh, David Brooks, uh, I know I mentioned all of conservatives now, George Will, uh, uh, Holman Jenkins, you know, they're not, they're not wrong. You know, I love, uh, I think Paul Ryan's wonderful. I think there are people on the other side too that just, they are very thoughtful about why these things are important, how societies go about it. And you know, I think we, sh we, we become more knee jerk. We've turned principles and ideology. And once it's ideology, your feet are stuck in cement. You can't move anymore. You can barely breathe. And then you just be angry. So, you know, if you watch Fox and you go home at night and say, yeah, they're right, you know, those terrible people, or you go home and watch NBC, MSNBC, they're just jazzing you up. You're just being manipulated. Learn to think for yourself about what the issues are, what the potential solutions are, what the unintended consequences are of policy issues. Because it's very easy to say, we'll do this, and very often it has the opposite effect. You think and the American public is being manipulated in a sense in this election? Allowing, we're allowing ourselves to be jazzed up by, I always say in management, you know, don't allow people walking off and just jazz you up and get you angry. You're just being manipulated when that happens. A Harvard study just came out that I found fascinating. It found only 19% of Americans between age 18 and 29 identified themselves as capitalists. Only 42% in that group even said that they supported capitalism. Jamie, when you hear those numbers, when you see those stats, what do you think? Yeah, it, it surprises me too. My whole life, I've seen every generation that graduates college coming out with big heart and they want to change the world, as I did, as I still do. So I completely sympathize with that. That one caught me off guard because I'm not sure that the American public knows that socialism means that the government owns everything. And I, I, I'm not sure that's really what they mean. I think what they, and I, I, you gotta divide, what they mean is they saw this big problem, they're mad at big institutions. All, all big institutions, the Congress, you know, big banks, big companies have all been kind of discredited. You know, sometimes fairly, sometimes unfairly. Uh, uh, but I don't think it's a good thing. And, I, and you know, a lot of people think we're not educating the kids about entrepreneurism, history, liberty, freedom, you know, what built America made it great, and that they're falling into this trap of, you know, <laughs> that socialism is what didn't work a lot of places. And, and uh, so it, it is a little surprising. You've said, I understand the anger. What do you mean? Well, I understand when the average American says, I didn't cause this problem. They look at the elites in their opinion, you know, big banks, big companies, Wall Street, uh, Washington, and I, I understand that. And I understand too that there are segments who've been left behind and they're angry. I think that we, if you do a trade deal, uh, that you should have really powerful trade assistance for those who are hurt. So you know, trade's been proven to be hugely beneficial, but it's beneficial for 99% of people. But that 1% or whoever it is that gets hurt, we should say to them, if you're, gonna, if you're hurt, we're gonna have income assistance, relocation, business redevelopment, all the things we said, that's fair. That's fair, we shouldn't hold back the progress from trade and technology, but you know, it's fair to lift up the people that are hurt by it, as opposed to killing the golden goose. On this note, is there a need for a more inclusive form of capitalism? We want, we should have an economy that works for everybody, absolutely. Now, I'm, I'm a little cautious to say what's long-term and short-term, because in a free society, what's long-term to you may be short-term to you and vice versa, and that's fair. your choice. So I'm a little worried about people dictating what they mean. So and, 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 more, and, and, a more inclusive capitalism. Yeah, when I, you look at those Harvard numbers, right? It's, it, that shocks a lot yeah, of people. That may be education, not capitalism. But, but, but I do agree, we should make it more inclusive in a way that people feel better. We're, long, we're investing for the long run. We're fixing the infrastructure people need. We're improving lives all the time. We're lifting up, you know, as society gets lifted up, everybody gets lifted up. I think that's better for society. And that's, that's far beyond just shareholders. I do want to talk about the populist anger that has carried uh, some of these campaigns, and we've seen it in 
uh, Bernie Sanders' campaign, and we've seen it in Donald Trump's campaign. Um, have you ever seen this much anger from the public at uh, the financial sector and just big corporations in general? And, and how do you think it manifests itself? What has this become? Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not an expert in that. I, I read a lot of history, and yes, we've seen it many times before. And you know, sometimes it's justified, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's finger pointing, and sometimes it's blaming everybody for the acts of one. I, I, so I, I don't know how it's going to manifest itself. I hope that, that the next president focuses on the things that make America better. I mean, we, I've already talked about, we, we have it so good, but we should acknowledge the flaws. I think Democrats should acknowledge that Republicans are terribly afraid of pork, you know, bad spending, bridges to nowhere, for good reason. I think the Republicans should acknowledge that we desperately need infrastructure. Desperately. Airports, bridges, tunnels, roads, hospitals. And then we should roll up our sleeves and get to work and figure out the way to do it well. And so I think if we do all these things right, I think America would be booming. So I'm just hoping the next president focuses on those things. Do you have hope that that's going to happen? I mean, this, this, we've needed that for a long time. Yeah, I, I have some hope it'll happen. Maybe the anger and stuff will get people to focus on, okay, now what are the solutions? You, you, you and I, you think I, this I anger can agree. Will I can agree. Into solutions. Yeah, because I can sit across the table from anyone and say, I agree, income inequality hasn't been fair. And then I say, but what would you do about it? How do we fix that? You know, and, and how do we fix it in a way that actually improves society? You know, the, way to, the ways to fix it, you know, if it's pure populism, you can look at Venezuela, Argentina, North Korea, Cuba, Ecuador. Well, that, that's not going to fix it. You know, if, if you talk about policies that work, Look at you know, countries like Singapore, South Korea, certain cities in America, certain states in America that lift up all their people. Mm -hmm. And so you know, to me, the, it's really important the policy be properly designed. It's not enough just to say, you know, to get angry over, over a subject. The number one thing that the next president, whoever it is, can do, should do to boost the U.S. economy, what is it? Get out there and say uh, America is a wonderful country. We are going to collaborate and fix our problems. It'll be even better for all of us and for the rest of the world. Donald Trump has talked uh, repeatedly about a 35% tariff on goods imported to this country from Mexico and China. Meg Whitman, CEO of HP, said that will throw this country into a massive recession. Is she right? I don't. I, Donald Trump also will say that I'm the negotiator. I want a better deal. So I, I don't know if he means the 35%. I, I think a well structured trade agreements are good for America. Every now and then they've been structured in a way that hurts certain people. I do think there are legitimate issues people say it's not working for everybody. And, but it, it works in general, so I'm in, generally in favor of trade, properly done. And so... Uh, but would tariffs like that throw this country into recession? I, I'd have to think hard about that. I don't know. I, I, the problem with tariffs like that is that the retaliation and everyone's talking. We went through that after the Great Depression or before the Great Depression. And, but like I said, you know, Donald Trump keeps on saying he's a negotiator. Mm -hmm. I, I, we'll see what he means when he you know, has, can actually negotiate. As the presumptive Republican nominee, he said that economic conditions in this country are so perilous right now that we're headed for a, quote, very massive recession. And he said it's a terrible time right now. What merit, Jamie, from your perspective and your seat do you give that argument? Look, I'm not, I'm not going to comment on Donald's arguments. Do you think that this country is headed for a very massive recession when you hear that? Because I think it scares a lot of Americans. I, I would have to ask a different question. Like, you know, does he mean five years from now, one year from now? So I, I just don't know. I think the country's doing okay. The economy's pl plying along. I think it's a fair criticism to say it should be doing better. Why isn't it? Mm -hmm. As you travel around this country, as you travel around the world and talk to global business leaders, heads of state, what do they say to you about the state of American politics and this election? They, first of all, they look at, you know, Americans should understand that this, they look at the American president as the leader of the free world. Yeah. They really do. And, you know, if I was traveling around 10 years ago, you know, I, there was a lot of, they were angry at us for a lot of different reasons, the ugly American type of thing. They want good American leadership. That's what they want. So they're closely watching the election. Remember, their, their politics have been complicated like this for a long time. Uh, uh, so they're trying to study it and understand it. But, uh, but they also have some comfort that America, as that great quote is, America, after exhausting all the possibilities, does the right thing. So I, I think they're hopeful that's the case. They're hopeful. They find comfort. There, there's no shock at what we're seeing right now? They're watching like we are. Before I let you go, back to Abraham Lincoln, final question. You'd point to him as an example for today's politicians. What are the lessons in this race right now that 
candidates on both sides can learn from Abraham Lincoln? You know, the, that when he became president, you become, and he was quite clear, he's president of all the people, white and black, Democrat and Republican, you, you owe the nation, you want to lift all the people up. After the war, I want to bind the wounds of the, of, of, of the families of lost people. And that, you know, that was the, the heart of the man. And so that, you know, every president that become president, they're president of all the people. Not, not just the, you know, the, the people who voted for them, but all the people now. And, and uh, I think we're going to need a little binding after this election.